What's up, guys? Thank you so much for tuning in today. This is Teresa Yanaris. Thanks for coming to my channel. You are in for a treat today. I am so excited. We have Dan Burke here today. He is the founder and president of the Avila Institute for Spiritual Formation, which offers graduate and personal enrichment studies in spiritual theology to priests, deacons, religious, and laity in 72 countries and prepares men for seminary in 14 dioceses. Dan is the author and editor of more than 15 books, which I love, on authentic Catholic spirituality. Uh, one of them I have here is Devil in the Castle, which is epic, get it. Uh, he also hosts the Divine Intimacy radio show with his wife, Stephanie, which is broadcast weekly on EWTN radio. Uh, past episodes can be found along with thousands of articles on the interior life at spiritual direct com. Dan, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's great to be with you, Teresa. And I have great news to report. My bio uh, is is about six months old that you that you read, and the we are now in thirty seven dioceses uh, helping prepare men for seminary, which is very cool. So, super excited to be able to serve guys who are becoming priests. That's incredible. I can't wait to ask. I'm going to ask you more about your institute because I, I've just have been nerding out on what you have going on. So I've, I'm just really excited that you're here today. You and I have a lot of overlap in uh, some of the aspects of what we find very important as far as teaching and educating Christians on, which is the renewal of the mind and leading yeah. thoughts and purposes captive to the obedience of Christ. So I wanted to actually open up by reading that scripture and then just giving you a minute to, to speak on this as we ground in. So, sure. so I'm going to go ahead and begin with, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh and using mere human weapons for the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. In as much as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. So Dan, I would just love to pass this your way and, and tell us what the directive from the Holy Scripture to to lead every thought and purpose away captive to the obedience of Christ means to you. What's cool about that is it, it's a central passage in my previous book, which is um, Spiritual Warfare and Discernment of Spirits. And what uh, the translation that you just read from is probably, uh, well, you, is, it the, um, is it the living translation or what translation were you using? That's the classic Amplified. Cla oh, Amplified, perfect. Because what it does is it gives all the nuances of each Greek word. And uh, yeah, in, in the Revised Standard, it says that we have divine power. So we're in a war, right? And then it says we have divine power, which is beautifully stated in the Amplified Version in various ways. And that divine power is to be applied because God gives it to us. It's to be applied to dealing with the battles in our mind, the, you know, not all the thoughts in our head uh, are ours and we shouldn't listen to them. You know, though they're 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 suggested to us by the enemy, they can also come through abuse and wounds and even the sins that we commit. And so, a lot of people struggle with these these um, tapes that run in their head about you know you're stupid, you're ugly, you're worthless, you know you can't do this, you know that drive us to shame. Um, whatever the lies are, lies about God and His goodness and His loving kindness lies about our lovability and our ability to love all. So there's all of these kinds of lies that come from us and the enemy and the world. Uh, and so St. Paul says by the power of the Holy Spirit, you have divine power to come against those lies and overcome those lies. You have divine power to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, which means by God's grace, we have the ability uh, to control what happens in our minds. And of course, not only do we have the ability to control, but we're commanded to, because Jesus said, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, um, uh, do I give to you. Uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid, which is a promise and a command, which then Paul reveals to the Holy Spirit, a, a kind of a deeper inner working. And then of course, he goes on in Romans 8 to say the mind set on the flesh is, is death, but the mind set on, set on the spirit is life and joy and peace. And Romans 12, where he says that um, we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, you know. So there's all this beautiful scripture in the New Testament 
that speaks of, you know, Jesus gave his life for us that we might be free. He came to free us and it was for freedom that he set us free, which of course you probably recognize as a quote, I think from Peter. So it was for freedom that he set us free. So what is that freedom? It's a freedom where we live in peace, no matter how difficult life is. So you asked me, you know, a small question, my answer is, you know, way too big so far, but it's exciting to me to know as someone who comes from a past of abuse and a past of a very difficult and dark childhood, it's, it's exciting for me to tell people you can be free and you can live in peace and you don't have to, you don't have to be a constant, a continuous victim from your suffering. You can be free in Christ. And so I love the fact you opened with that passage. Yeah. And you just touched on something. I'm going to pivot from my list of questions here because you just touched on something that I think is a heart of, of what people are going through in, in the world. They have trauma, right? People come from a lot of trauma. And I find that people that are uh, maybe not raised Christian, or maybe they are, and then they leave Christianity and they go off into the world and they're, they're dealing with their trauma in ways that doesn't actually heal. They're looking to the world. They're looking to vices. They're looking to sin and they're looking to the world to fill this hole. That is a Jesus sized hole that can't be filled by idols. Can you speak to that concept for a moment? Yeah. I mean, I did it right. I mean, uh, for me, it was alcohol, um, and work those were my inebriations and and i when we have this suffering and pain we have an ache to be free we also have an ache to be one with god an ache to be loved and to know love like in its truest most pure sense and all of those drives not you know improperly ordered uh lead us to uh, false solutions that the devil proposes and of course those false solutions only reinforce a kind of cycle of victimhood Whereas Jesus is calling us out of that cycle into a true and perfect liberation. I mean, you know, there was a time when I was tortured by my thoughts and they controlled me and I was tortured by my own emotions related to those thoughts. And I was tortured by nightmares and tortured by, you know, just this view of myself that was not of God. And, and so God be praised uh, that ache in my own soul you know, led me to come to know him and allow him to heal me and, and to, uh, to be open to the divine surgery, which can be difficult to face. But ultimately, it's, it's necessary for our salvation. But look, you know, life is hard. Why make it harder? You know, uh, it can be a glorious battle instead of a brutal, dark, you know, brooding uh, with no hope. So for me, all of this reality is why I put the gun away uh, when I was a young man and considering taking my life and instead asked the Lord to show me why do we suffer? I didn't know him, but I was asking whatever, the big guy in the sky, what's the reason for all this suffering and why should I continue, keep putting it out? Why should I live? Because I couldn't conceive of any rational reason to continue to live unless there was a reason for suffering. And of course, you and I both know not only is there a reason, but there's a glorious reason. It's, it's, it's what purifies it. It's like good surgery. Divine surgery is a surgery of love that removes everything in us that hinders us from receiving the love that God has for us and giving it to others. Yeah. I thought, I think it's also interesting to consider, I, I work with women who are getting freed of occult bondage and they're, they're being transformed by Jesus Christ. And so they're letting go of a lot and there's a lot wrapped up in the process of deliverance and sanctification and, and all of this and i find that in the i call it being in the woods and not being out of the woods yet but when they choose to give their life to christ there's usually a lot of spiritual warfare that ramps up at this time when it comes to intrusive thoughts specifically yeah. and trying to drag it's then we trying to drag them back into bondage and because they're in this middle ground area where they haven't fully committed yet they're still going through that process of taking in the holy scriptures and really understanding what it means to put on the identity in christ and i find that this is i call it not being out of the woods yet because they're still in that they're locked in that very strong battle and what i love about uh the book that you wrote uh devil in the castle you talk about this beautifully where you describe the the change the the progress of the soul as it leaves bondage and it's moving towards sanctity and i, I was wondering can you walk us through just like on a high level what this process looks like? Sure. So, 
there are seven mansions that St. Teresa uses the a castle because in her day, like one of her monasteries in Medina del Campo was a mile from this, you know, big, beautiful castle with a moat. So she had the, these things in her head, but she thought it a good analogy to describe how a person begins to enter into uh, the journey to a deeper relationship with God. And each of the rooms, uh, there are specific uh, things that we can do to help us on our journey and corresponding to God, and then specific ways that the devil uh, tries to attack us so that we understand how to yield to God and how to fight the enemy. And so she goes through that progression. And, and I, I have some good news for those you help. And that is, if you stay in the fight, you will win. I mean, I work with, I've worked with uh, those who are fully possessed in exorcism, and it's the worst kind of a, the effect of the occult uh, that you can experience. And, and what I remember telling one victim that the right never fails as long as you persevere. So if you persevere, you will be free. And that I can, you know, I'm 57, I've seen a lot. I can promise you, I've never met a, met a person who when they decided I'm gonna persevere no matter what, I've never met a single one who didn't get free, not a single one, no matter how. And I'm talking about even somebody who was given up in a satanic mass when they were four sexually, like the worst kind of abuse. I've seen that kind of person get free. Um, and so anyone can get, if she, you know, if that one can get free, anyone can get free. But the secret word is of course, perseverance in Jesus, perseverance or the phrase, perseverance in Jesus, stay in the fight um, and you will win because he has won and he wants you to win. Thank you so much for saying that. I really appreciate you saying that because I, I do work with people from across the gamut at different stages in their journey. And I know that that will be very encouraging to them because they hear it from me, but it's great to hear it from other people too. It's like, yeah. yes, keep yeah. going, baby, go. Keep uh, going. Thank you so much for speaking to that. Okay. So here, let me see what I want to ask. Cause I have so many questions for you. Uh, okay. So when you really start to crucify the flesh and put on the new creation in Christ, you mentioned how tax ha tactics of the enemy change actually sure. shift and change. Can you talk us through well, when, how, when you enter into a deeper relationship with Christ, how these attacks changed and how uh, people can be prepared? Yeah, I can give you uh, a, an example from the first mansion, but then also address it from an overview. The, in the first mansion, you already alluded to this problem. And that is when someone decides to follow Jesus, and begin to try to trust and accept all that he has for them, the enemy will come out in, a, in really great force. And in some ways that force is felt because usually our lives are entangled with the sin that we've chosen. So it involves people, it involves substances, it involves practices, it involves you know, all of that. And so the reason it's so intense is because you know, the Lord is showing up on the scene. He's lighting up the reality and we're going, oh God, you know, and I mean, oh God, in, the, in a good way. I don't mean to use, I'm not using the Lord's name in vain. Oh God, I can't believe how much of a mess I'm in. And wow, this is hard and so good. So people, and then the people who are most influenced by the enemy in that first phase, and actually this happens for a few of the mansions early on, the people who are most influenced will come and then try to entice you back. And so sometimes you have to make a decision. Can I, I know I'm going after Jesus. Can I help this person? It's not a difficult question to answer. You know, go a month with them and ask the question, am I closer to Christ or further? If you're further, you got to ditch the relationship. There's just no way around that. You may be able to come back. You, you can tell the person, I love you. And I, which happened to me, by the way, my best friend, I, I lost. I, and I said, I really want to be your friend, but I can't do what I used to do anymore. You know, Jesus has changed me. I want you to come with me to this concert. I want you to come, you know, Christian concert. I want you to come with me to church. And he just said no. And it, you know, rips my heart out thinking about it. But you have to make those choices. Uh, I have another person I'm working with who's a cocaine addict. And, you know, his best friend was a dealer. It's like, okay. You know, I'm sorry, but you, that's insane. You can't have that. If you really want to be free, 
you can't have that close of an access to the thing that keeps you in bondage. So that's why it's so difficult early. But then as you progress, the cool thing is the, the deeper you get into the castle, the less power the demons have over you. And the closer, you, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, your will is stronger because each time you fight instead of yield, you get stronger. So your will is stronger. Two, you're, you're, be, you're drawing near to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and they're deathly afraid of him. Um, they are deathly afraid of him. He, he, he can do anything to them he wants, and they know it. They, he has total power over them, and they know it. And so as you get closer to him and you become more like him, you become more and more repulsive instead of friendly. It, that shifts. So you, you actually begin to stink you know how bad things to good people stink, right? Well, to the devil, good things stink and you're repulsive. I, I like to tell the story. I was working with this one person who was possessed. And when you work with the possessed, they become part of your lives. It's, it's normal, at least in the way we deal with it in Apostoli VA. And this person was fully possessed and still in the process and tried to come into our home. And they were not able to cross the threshold of our home because the demon said, I hate this place. I hate these people. I hate all the prayer that goes on here. I hate the freedom that comes. But, but as you can imagine then, anyone who's trying to get free, as you get closer to the King of Kings, you become repulsive like that. So the demons don't like being near you. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say, just as a general overview of the progression, is the devil's power is, is related strictly to your attachments into your sin. So the more, the less you're attached to, the more sin you have, the more handles he has to jerk you around. You can think of like a, if you're a, every young mom in this age has those backpacks that have those little cords on them. So when they go to the mall, they don't lose their little one running off, but the backpacks usually have a handle and you can grab the little one by that handle and say, nope, we're not going that way. We're going this way, right? Well, sin works that way where we have all these handles and the devil can grab us and jerk us around. The closer we are to Jesus, those handles melt away. Every time we overcome that habitual sin, that handle is gone. Every time we overcome that vice or that hatred or that unforgiveness, that handle is gone. And so that's why it's a, that's why, um, that's why I wanted to write this book is to illustrate how Teresa reveals that beautiful progression of freedom in the yeah. interior life. Yeah. I thought it was interesting how you mentioned in the beginning stages, having to let go of friendships and you're talking about attachments too. It's like attachments to sin and also attachments to things in our lives that can be leading us to sin or causing sure. that sin. And, and I call, I have a, in my program, in the beginning stage of the program, there's a whole unit called close the doors. And, and we talk about all the different ways that you have to close those doors. You just, you just have to. And so I wanted to ask you, and I'm sure you're very intimately knowledgeable about this concept. Uh, can you talk for a moment about how important renunciation of the oh, devil is in closing spiritual doors? Have you read Spiritual Warfare and Discernment of Spirits? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. Well, when I teach the class Discernment of Spirits in uh, in the Avila Institute or when I do events or whatever, we've learned that it's it's incredibly powerful to take people through renunciations. Mm -hmm. What are renunciation? Renunciations come when we begin to be awake to the patterns of the enemy's work, right? And then those patterns reveal lies we believe, strongholds like we opened this, you opened the show with today, um, wounds that we have. And so when it's super powerful, when somebody becomes able through prayer and the things like you teach and we teach to think about their thinking, right? So it's, it's, so they can almost step, and it's some, it's a gift in our design. I think it's something about being um, made in the image of God that we can think about our thinking, we can get outside of ourselves. And then you begin to see these patterns and then you realize, oh, this, I, it, you know, this shame I'm feeling is not from God because he loves me. And I, the scripture says he loves me. He created me before the foundation of the world in Ephesians. Um, and he set me apart for a particular purpose. And, and I am his and he is mine and he formed me in my mother's womb. And so you're, you're, you know it's a lie. And so you say, in Jesus' name, I renounce the lie that I am, uh, that I am uh, unworthy of love. 
in Jesus name. And that, and that is a pushing out of the devil's lie by the power of Jesus name. And then something I think uh, as important as renunciation is uh, affirmations. So uh, I have this post out on spiritual direction called, who are you? And it's a beautiful list of, of affirmations where if you've never experienced this, and I'm just looking at it now, who are you? And it's a bunch of lists of scripture passages that say who you really are. So as an example, um, you are God's child, John 1, 12. You are Christ's friend, John 15, 15. You are a citizen of heaven. You are hidden in Christ before God. You are forgiven. You are loved. You know, all of these things. So you can do the renunciation, but it's also important. And this is taught in, uh, you know, fifth century desert fathers, Evagrius, wrote about it in a book called Talk, Talking Back, newly in English in the past few years. But it's the same concept that Jesus used in the wilderness and when he was tempted in dealing with the devil. And that is the devil proposes an idea to you that's a lie and you fight back with scripture. Often he'll use scripture too. But this way you use scripture and say, no. So I, I renounce the lie that I am unlovable and I embrace the truth in Jesus name that I am a child of God, that he has accepted me. He loved me. He created me with a purpose. Like he, Teresa, he's, I know you know this, but he saw you before the foundation of the world. And he said, you are beautiful. I want to be with you for all of eternity. And so he placed you in your mother. He assigned you to your mother's womb, you know, through your father and your mother's relationship or however it came to be. But he assigned you there so that you could come into being so that you could love him and he could love you. And so you, you embrace those truths, you affirm them as, a, as an act of faith, and that is spiritual warfare. It doesn't sound like spiritual warfare, but it really is. Absolutely. It's, it's such a beautiful thing to consider. And it's like, you can't, I love how you just described that because it, it's not enough to just turn away, right? You can't just turn away. You can't sit in this middle ground. You have to turn in toward Christ. That's how you get the transformation. You can't just sit in the middle. There's no middle. The middle ground is not where you want to be. <laughs> well, and, no. and, yeah. And Jesus warned, he said, he said, uh, and I'm adding a little bit to what he said, but it's fairly well understood that this is what he was teaching. When you empty the space of the demonic, you have to fill it with good or seven more are gonna come back and fill it again. Yeah. So when people go through the occult and they get delivered, in fact, it's, it's interesting because these people become very holy, the ones who succeed mm -hmm. because they know the holiness and, a, and a, a heightened vigilance is necessary to keep the enemy away. And if they drop their guard at all, usually because they're sensitive, he can come back and, and disturb and disrupt them, maybe not take all the ground back, but he can have an effect on them. So we have to, so that's where that idea comes from. It's Jesus saying, you know, you got to sweep the house clean uh, and fill it essentially with other good things or else it's going to be filled again with the bad. So yeah. And exactly I find that right. you have to teach, you have to teach it as a practice because people are not initially going to be equipped and know how to do that. And so I call it Christ captivity <laughs> where it's like, yeah. okay, you get that intrusive thought. Okay. Now let's, let's find out like, what's that? Is that spirit of condemnation? Okay. Well, let's find the antonym of that. And now let's, let's find Holy scripture. Let's get out our concordance and let's combat that and Perfect. let's install, you know, and you walk them through that. And then they start to do it on a regular basis and it becomes practice and it becomes a habit and then they're not being affected so much by those negative thoughts because they realize okay i'm identifying that you talked about thinking about thinking right like, yeah taking that up a level metacognition it's so yeah, important no, not that you know something else it's important for people to know i did a survey once the best group in facebook is called authentic contemplative prayer turned by connie rossini uh, for prayer anyway and I did a survey of that group and the, the makeup of that group is people like you, very devout, all of them practice mental prayer. You know, they're all working toward the Lord. Around 85% of the group said they struggle with negative thoughts every week of their life. So this is not just a battle that people who have suffered what I've suffered or those you serve suffer. This is a battle everybody suffers because it's necessary, you know, Teresa and the devil in the castle, I talk about how she describes, she uses uh, synonyms for the demons, uh, reptiles and, you know, creatures or whatever. And Jesus did the same thing, but 
she, she says, why does God allow them to bite and nip at you? Not to devour you, but to bite and nip at you. It's to wake you up to the reality of the battle you're in so you can learn to fight and get strong. So these principles really help us to understand, okay, how does this work and how do I get free? Yeah. I wanted to, thank you for that. I wanted to ask you a little bit about sacrament. So uh, as you know, I work with people getting free to the occult and I, I strongly encourage them to get anchored into sacramental based faiths led by priests through apostolic authority, uh, apostolic succession. And there are circumstances where a spiritually afflicted person will have strong negative reactions to the Eucharist. Uh, right. They'll experience vexation, bruising, uh, sometimes actually experiencing deliverance at the point of absolution after auricular confession. Can oh, you yeah. speak to that? I'd love to hear some of your stories on the efficacy and importance of leaning into the sacramental life. Well, so I've been in a lot of exorcisms and some, a lot of people are surprised to know that the, the sacrament of confession is actually way more powerful than exorcism. What exorcism does is it beats up the demon so that the person can exercise their will and say yes to God. I mean, that's the end. That's the goal of the exorcism. And once the person can do that, the enemy has to leave, you know. So, but, but confession in one fell swoop, given the proper disposition of the person, can, can eliminate any sort of demonic attachment and set a person free. It, 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 it renders you, of course, totally forgiven of mortal sin, venial sin, but then it, it reconciles you to God. So that means you're now, you're now very close to the, to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one that they're deathly afraid of. You know, One of the stories I told in the book uh, comes out of um, the book of her life, uh, the autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila. And there was a priest actually where the Lord revealed he was possessed by two demons and he was possessed because he was committing mortal sin of some kind, we don't know what it was. But it was interesting that he could still perform mass, but the demons, she watched them totally afraid of the Lord in the Eucharist, like just cowering with fear, even though they were in the presence. So I think um, though, as you know, there are cases where people need, um, they have to have a dispensation from the bishop so that they can deal with uh, really huge significant issues, especially if they're fully possessed. So they, they won't be able to go to confession without a full blown manif manifestation or receive the Eucharist without a full blown manifestation. Those are rare cases. Most of the time when people come to me and I've even had a, uh, an example, a religious uh, who couldn't pray the rosary. And I just talked with her about the battle was going on. I said, when you get become sick as you begin to pray, just say, in Jesus' name, I renounce the sickness. I embrace the reality that the, the Blessed Mother is here to protect me and to help me. And so I taught her how to fight. And then the next time she went and prayed the rosary, she could pray it and there were no issues. So many times those who are afflicted, but not fully possessed, they need to just know how, they just need to hang in there. And I know it's hard because I've experienced it. I had, I was never possessed, but I, because of my mother's involvement in the occult and my own complicity with uh, some aspect of that, I had um, mortal sin that allowed for a severe oppression, which uh, gave me some repulsion for holy things. So I understand the feeling and, uh, but you just have to fight it. And if you're under good spiritual direction, your director or someone like you can, can help you make a judgment if you needed it. But usually it's just for people who are fully possessed in, in more severe cases. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting you bring up the concept of spiritual direction because what I found and why I even started my program in the first place was because I saw people getting freed of the occult and then they didn't really know where to go because they're experiencing vexation, oppression, some in some cases possession, and maybe perhaps they had a bad experience with the church whatever denominations. And so they're, they're not going to the churches, but they go on social media or they go online and you see these people that say, Oh, DM me for deliverance or come over here and let, and they're teaching all this really bad information. And I found, wow, these people have no idea what they're talking about. And they're actually creating a very dangerous environment for these people that need legitimate spiritual direction. And so, so what I've heard from some of the people that took my program is like, okay, this is new because you're actually 
telling us, go into the church, get, go talk to a priest. You need to learn about auricular confession. You need to be praying your rosary. You need to, you know, those things that like people have such a negative opinion about uh, Catholicism or, uh, you know, Anglicanism or Orthodoxy, those specific communions that are apostolically based and sacramental. And those are really the ones that I'm finding the people that are leaving the occult are actually drawn to or should be drawn to because that's where they're going to really get that uh, deliverance and sanctification. What are your thoughts? Yeah, on that? I mean, in particular, of course, I would agree with you. I was an Anglican seminarian before I became Catholic. But the Anglican ordinary tradition um, and those traditions you mentioned are deeply rooted in, in the apostolic faith, which means they have with them the power. You mentioned apostolic succession, which I think most people don't know what it is. Your listeners maybe do. But it's the idea of the power and authority given by Jesus to his success, you know, those who are ordained and, and his successors. And so it, it, um, it, it, it's certainly the, the, the place where the most powerful tools can be found to become free. Uh, you can't be free. I mean, uh, taking the body and blood uh, into you, I, I mentioned the possessed person couldn't come into our home. Why is that? Because everyone who worked that my home used to be the home base of the Apple Institute. It was a 4,000 square foot home, every square foot, but our bedroom was filled with people working. And um, so everyone there went to daily mass. Everyone there went to monthly confession. Everyone there was immersed in the sacraments, which was why the place was so repulsive and difficult for the enemy to deal with. So when you do that as an individual and you choose to avail yourself of those graces, uh, you become repulsive. And let's say even you're deeply oppressed, whatever that enemy, whatever the hold on you he has, the sacraments will begin to weaken the muscles, if you will, and the talons um, and loosen them up and give you the ability to be, to be free. I want, thank you for that. I want to ask you for a moment about blending occult beliefs and practices with Christianity. It's something that I'm seeing across the board a lot, especially in America, but this is worldwide as people are getting really confused about Christianity as a whole. You look at the statistics, some people consider themselves Christian, but they don't even believe in God. It's a mess as I'm sure you're well aware. And this creates uh, lots of open doors for the demonic, lots of open doors for oppression. Uh, and they're, they're deceived by spiritual entities that they think are positive right. beings, but they're actually the demonic. Can you speak to this for a moment? Yeah. I mean, of course, Catholic mindfulness is probably the latest where you have somebody who's trying to mix the eightfold path of Buddhism uh, with Catholicism. And what scripture says is that these religions are the product of, or the product of demons. I mean, I didn't make that up. That was the Holy Spirit. So if they're the, if they're the product of demons, that means that when we practice anything related to those religions, we are opening the door to demonic influence. And I use the same analogy as you. I, I used to live in Bessemer, Alabama, which had the distinction of being the most violent city per capita of under 100,000. And I said, it's sort of like living in downtown Bessemer and leaving your doors and windows open. You know, So every time you look to the occult, you're you're like taking out a window and setting it aside and for the bad guys to come get you it's you are actually inviting them when you practice these things so enneagram is very popular and extremely destructive there are people who become a, a possessed um, using uh, the enneagram uh, ouija board is famous uh, among exorcists so common for people to use who are experiencing severe oppression or possession from ouija board you know, so we really, what we need to do is, you know, if we want to be free, we got to use, look, <laughs> you, the, the catechism says the entire divine economy is ordered for, to bring you with you to union with God. That means this whole thing, in spite of all the broken people, set that aside, because that's always been the case. I mean, it started with Judas and it's, it's the same today. But in spite of all of that, the entire divine economy, which is apostolic succession, the priesthood, the sacraments, are given to you to get in there. All you need to be free and, and saved. All you need to see heaven. And so the enemy tries to entice us to try to control the circumstances in our life that are, that are difficult for us. And it's a lie. Because let's say 
you do it and you experience some measure of control. So you've just become complicit with a demon to achieve an end. That means now you are his slave. That's how it works spiritually. When you, when you follow a demon, they now have enslaved you. You can get free, um, but you have to understand, I wrote an article about uh, Black Lives Matter and the cultic origins of that uh, group. Uh, I wrote an article a few years ago. And what I said to them is, so you might say, well, they do some good. You know, I'm sure they do, um, but you, you can't, nobody would join with the demonic to do good. There's plenty of other good organizations that help minorities, that help people, you know, suffering oppression or injustice to be free. No way in the world would I ever join with an organization whose founders openly admit that they call upon demons uh, to help them in their mission. You can read it, it's at Crisis Magazine uh, called the, Black, uh, the Cultic Origins of Black Lives Matter. Oh, okay, I'll go grab a link and drop that in the description so people can read it. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, I wanted to pivot for a minute because I do want to ask you about discernment of spirits because I know that we've been talking a little bit about devil in the castle. I wanted to talk a little bit about spiritual warfare and the discernment of spirits and just ask you, can you describe what is discernment and how can we effectively discern spirits? Yeah, so the scripture, of course, you know, uh, speaks of it. John speaks of it, Paul speaks of it, and uh, they admonish us to discern the spirits to see whether they're from God. Spirits are either good spirits or bad spirits, right? So they're either emissaries of God or emissaries of the devil or the devil himself. And they, and discernment of spirits is becoming awake to how they work, um, knowing where influences that you experience come from, whether it's from God or the enemy, and then the process of, of dealing with it. So we are awake to it. We understand how they work. We know the sources, we know how to fight. That's discernment of spirits. So as an example, uh, one of the worst bits of advice that is given uh, a million times in the church is if you feel peace, um, it's whatever you desire to do in that circumstance that you're discerning, it's from God. And that is a horrible advice because without understanding what the state of the soul is, you can't make that discernment. So in discernment of spirits, uh, as taught by St. Ignatius, rule one deals with people who are going from mortal sin to mortal sin. So in that rule, when you're in mortal sin, the good spirit, the one from God, is making you uncomfortable. He's biting and, and, he's, and he's telling you, you know, Teresa, not that you would need this, but Teresa, don't do that. That is not my will. You know, you're going to harm yourself. You're going to harm somebody else, you know. And what is the bad spirits doing? Saying, Teresa, you're, you're a really good person. And you're doing this for good reasons. And you should just keep doing this, right? So, so in, in rule number one, it's the exact opposite of what everyone says. Rules two through 14. So now I have the real Teresa, right? Intensely, as Ignatius describes, going from good to better. That's who you are. So in that case, everything changes. Now the bad spirits will make you uncomfortable when you're going toward the good and the good spirits will encourage you. So that's just an example of uh, discernment spirits in action. And it's so important because <coughs> when you look at people who are in the occult and they're fraternizing with demons, they're thinking, oh no, this is all fine. And, and what you find it across the way, so people, when they're getting freed of the occult and they're leaning into the scriptures, there's a difference because they're actually now looking at what? The Holy scriptures. That's the difference, right? right? It's like when you're not taking things to Christ, how do you do that? How do you start? But okay, by baptizing yourself in the word and getting in the word, that's how the discernment is, because that means to cut, right? That's how that even yeah. begins. Because before you're in the, the kingdom, before you're in the Bible, you don't have the ability to discern what's what, because you're not basing it on any kind of framework that helps you to see that. Well, Jesus himself too followed your advice, right? Uh, before you ever gave it. <laughs> he, how did he fight the devil on the Mount of Temptation? I was just there in, in Israel uh, it's outside of Jericho. It's an amazing place. It's a wow. Russian Orthodox um, monastery up on these cliffs. It's just really something else. But yeah, when the devil was tempting him, Jesus responded with scripture. And so scripture is the highest form of public revelation. And a lot of people think with Catholics that, you know, um, it's subordinate to tradition. No, it's the highest form of tradition. 
Um, and so there, there can't be any tradition that, uh, that contradicts scripture that's true, you know, or any magisterial teaching from the hierarchy of the church. So uh, scripture is the highest form of public revelation. It's the, cl it's the clearest and deepest water when it comes to helping us to know Jesus. And then of course, helping us to know anything we need to know about fighting with the enemy. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I, you've just been so delightful and refreshing. I would love to end with a question if you wouldn't mind just sharing us a quick story about how you founded your institute. I have to know. Sure, okay. So interesting. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So <laughs> what happened was I we, we had spiritualdirection.com grew like crazy. I thought like eight people would be interested. We have now hundreds of thousands of subscribers, readers in 190 countries. But so the, they just kept saying, please give us more. Would you give us classes? I'm like, I can't give you classes. We can do webinars. They said, okay, great. We'll, we'd love to do webinars. So we started doing that. And then they said, well, we love the webinars. We still want the classes. And I thought, ah, so I, the Lord introduced me to Dr. Anthony Lillis in May of 2013, a little bit before that. We became fast friends, started working on a book together. And I told him, I said, I have a dream, Dr. Lillis. And he's he's been the founder of one seminary and then he's been the rector now of three seminaries uh different places in the world uh united states and so he's he's the best spiritual theologian of our time just to make sure i give him due so i said dr lillis i have a dream i said in 10 years this is 2013 may I said i have a dream in 10 years i would like to found a school that emulates what has been done historically at the Tricianum in rome which is the spiritual formation center of the world for for decades you know but i said i want it for everyone who can who wants it and i want to give it away to everyone who can not afford it so that all the people of god have all the best food you know so he's so excited he said well i, have a, I had a this is a long story but i had a bad day at the seminary yesterday you're you're consoling me he said i want to do it now i said cool my first book I made $25,000 in advanced sales and I put it in a nonprofit to help people spiritually. I just didn't know how, mostly the poor. So I said, I know why now I have that money. I called a developer and I said, can you, by the end of June, have a school administration system up? He said, you're crazy, but I love the idea. And I said to Dr. Lowe's, can you have the curriculum for a master's program done by the end of June? He said, absolutely, I can. So, so from the one phone call of, I'd like to do this in 10 years, we had our first cadre of students in uh, September of 2013, which was 58 students, religious and laity. And now we serve about 600 students a quarter from now 90 countries. Yeah, so- Speechless. Boom, right? Boom, Just, God's like, okay, you ready? Yeah. Let's go. It's the Lord's will. I mean, it, what a whirlwind. And so- and I, of course, at the same time, working at EWTN, I was running the National Catholic Register. I eventually became president of EWTN News, but at the same time, Avila Foundation and our community was growing like crazy. And so I, it's like being on one foot on one boat and the other, and they're growing and you're going, okay, I have to make a decision. So a few years ago, before the big COVID bomb hit, I uh, jumped ship and, and I've been full-time with Avila and the community since then. Wow. Oh my goodness. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to drop links to all of this below in the description. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've been so excited to interview you and please keep me in the loop on how I can support whatever you have going on. Well, I really appreciate it. I'd like to learn actually more about uh, your ministry and what you're doing there. So send me an email and uh, it's been great to meet you. I'm, I really have enjoyed your enthusiasm and the good work you're doing is so important. Uh, the Lord gave his life so that people could be free and you're giving your life to help them to do the same in his power. So I'm grateful to you for that. Amen. Thank you so much, Dan. And everyone, this is Dan Burke. He's author of many amazing books, but today we've been talking about spiritual warfare and the discernment of spirits and the devil in the castle. You can find his website at spiritualdirection.com and I'll be sure to drop other links. Again, this is Tracy Nairs. Thank you so much for watching the show today. Go on down there, hit the like, hit the subscribe, hit the bell, hit all the buttons, do all the things, and we'll see you on the next video.